I'm talking today about blame and trust in organisations and the, the sort of three key points I want to get across. One is about um, what is trust, another is what is blame and then the third thing is what is the connection between them if any because I'm not a great believer in blame but organisations tend to want to apportion blame if something goes wrong and they can either apportion it to a framework or to a set of people or an individual and in both instances it's probably misplaced. B blame isn't going to solve a problem, it's better to trust than blame. It's lovely to be here and it's great to see so many people. Um, I met Joe and Zoe last October at another conference presentation and little did I know when I was chatting to them in the coffee break that I would be here now. So it's great to be here. The other thing that is interesting for me is that I am now um, working for the Department for Work and Pensions as a government employee. So I've got now three months of um, a knowledge of what working in a government department is like. So that's, that's very, very interesting. And there's a lot of stuff about trust and blame that I'm coming up against every single day and working with and, and um, sort of thinking through. And I was really interested to see your um, question for reflection for this evening or this afternoon. Reflect on your own view of blame and how you handle difficulties and challenge and then thinking about blame in relation to trust. And it's kind of interesting if you just think, well, I'll tell you what, what my day looks looked like so far. Because I got up and I took one of the Boris bikes from where I live in central London to Paddington. So I inserted a little key in that slot and I trusted that it was going to work. And it did, so that was good. And then I got to the station and I trusted that the train would arrive on time and that it would get here. And that all of that worked like clockwork and I arrived here. And if you think through your day, you've just had lunch, you're trusting things in your environment all the time, just sitting here, looking at your binder. And if you just think through your own day today, what have you trusted? You've trusted that the tap will turn on, that there'll be clean water coming out, etc., etc. One person's tap didn't turn on, <laughs> did it? <laughs> okay, so there you are. Now, who is she going to blame for her tap not turning on? Or is blame appropriate? What, what, what is a better approach to that? So when you're thinking about your day and who you're trusting all the time, sort of implicitly, each time you cross the road, you're trusting that you're not going to be knocked over by totally unknown drivers to you. And you're living through that. You can start to assess what is your level of trust generally and who would you blame if that's an appropriate reaction. And I wonder whether blame is ever an appropriate reaction. Where does it get you? Is it a problem-solving attribute? And blame to me is not really a, pro a problem-solving attribute. So there, but there is some connection between trust and what you do when something goes wrong. So if we just think about that, I'm just getting the clicker now, because what I'm going to look at is three things in relation to that. <coughs> um, the first thing is what trust is and how you might define it. And, I see from your questions and um, on the slide thing here that you're looking at it in, in relation more to individual and relationship trust, but I'm going to offer another idea about it. Then designing trust balance with risk. And um, as you heard, most of my working life is involved in organisation design of one type or another. And that, can you design in trust? Can you design out blame? Are sorts of the questions that I'm asking myself. And then delivering the trust. I'm going to cover those three things, starting with a definition. So the first thing is, it's a relationship in which, it is relationships in which people are trustworthy. And one of the things about being trustworthy, now think about the trip I just told you. The train drivers and the crew and the schedules and what have you, you know, I looked at the schedule and it said that the train was going to leave at um, <clears throat> 7.45 this morning, whatever time, I think it was 7.45. Um, I believed it, it was trustworthy. Because I have, in the course of my experience, I haven't had reason to doubt that train schedules are tremendously wrong. I, I have found out subsequently that they pad them a bit in case there's a sort of slowdown. So that was, a, that was interesting finding. Um, so there's something about trustworthiness and its relationship to trust. And then it's a willingness to be vulnerable to another party when that party can't be controlled. 
And now think about that. I am vulnerable to the train network working. I can't control it. I just have to trust that it's going to work. And so is turning on the tap and expecting clean water, etc. So you're not just trusting, relationships are not just, trust is not just about relationships, I suggest. It's about trusting systems and processes and stuff going on in your life, which is, which you couldn't function without trusting, basically. You know, if you want, if you want the lights to go light, you switch something on and you trust they're going to go light. Um, and so start to think about trust as about systems and processes as well as about relationships. Now, when you think about that, I'm going to start looking at these four pictures. Can everybody see them okay, roughly speaking? Okay, so the, the top one is trapeze artists. Now, think about that, the trapeze artists. They are trusting, obviously, each other. And they're trusting the tensile strength of the steel. They're trusting the people who... I don't imagine that the trapeze artists put up the bars that they're swinging from. You know, there are people who put up the bars for them to swing from. They're trusting that the steel is whatever, or ropes, whatever holds that, is going to hold, etc., etc. A mass of trust is not just relationships in being that tra trapeze artist, if you start to think it through. Now, if you start to think in number two, trust me, I'm a doctor. And that's a very interesting dynamic to think about where people are placed. And organisationally, it's quite important, I think, that people tend to think if you've got a position of expertise or power or something that is different from what you've got, you can tend to feel inadequate yourself. And you trust that person. So people tend to trust doctors without necessarily checking. You tend to trust somebody in a more senior position without necessarily checking. So what is your tendency to trust someone who says they're a professional, for example? And you can start to think, where does trust need to... And there's a great phrase, trust but verify. Um, you know, you can trust your doctor, but maybe you should verify. And, and there are all sorts of professions where it's a good idea and, the, you know, e endless newspaper reports of where people have trusted professionals and it hasn't, or people who said they were professionals and something's happened. And so you then start to think if something goes wrong in that relationship, if you take those two things of the trapeze artist or the doctor, and if something goes wrong, now ask yourself, is it appropriate to blame? And what would you blame? You know, if a rope fails, in the trapeze thing or the steel cable. Would you blame the manufacturer of the steel cable? Would you blame the person who erected it? it? Of course, it depends on what bit of it broke. But there's a, you know, and that's one of the interesting things. I don't know if you've been following the um, Exxon Valdez uh, thing going on in the Gulf of Mexico. There are, every, there are so many contractors involved, and there's a newspaper quote, everybody wants to blame each other. Because there isn't a sort of causal link, the things went wrong in between um, because it wasn't linked up correctly in terms of systems and processes. So in that sense, although they want to blame each other, it may not be appropriate. It's a failure of connectivity in systems and processes and way people communicate, etc. There isn't a single point of blame, potentially. If you look at the third one, people in organisations try and put in things and this is trust service principles, that will mitigate against getting blamed somehow or other. So you could say that they were to develop trust, but they're also to avoid being blamed if something happens. If people adhere to the principles of trust, so security, availability, processing, integrity, confidentiality and privacy, and these are some IT systems um, frameworks, then, the, then if something goes wrong, people can say, oh, look, but we were adhering to these principles. But frameworks don't cover every eventuality, as anyone who's been through airline security knows. The, the framework for getting through airline security is not going to mitigate against an aircraft disaster because somebody or something, because the security comes after the previous accident. It's with hindsight, not foresight. So, and that's an interesting thing, is blame with hindsight and can you trust with foresight or avoid blame with foresight rather than hindsight. 
And then the fourth one, you've got a set of four people talking to each other, which is a sort of relationship. And you, they look kind of jolly in that, and you might assume that they're all getting on with each other. However, it's quite difficult to judge. Obviously, we don't have got any information. But suppose they're drinking a, from a glass of something, and they're obviously trusting the contents of the glass. But suppose one of them is sick, sick the next day. You know, is that... Is that uh, predictable, potentially? Or is someone not going to drink out of the glass because it happens to be in some country where they fear they might get some bug? And uh, it's very interesting. I spent quite a lot of time in America, and Americans go around with handfuls of antiseptic wipes, wiping every surface before they'll touch it. A very different culture about the sort of thing about what they trust and what they don't trust. So, so that raises a whole set of questions that I would like you to consider in your table groups. Now, this is a huge group, so I've brought a bell. So if you hear a bell go off, it means stop talking, okay? So the idea is that you talk to each other, and you can take either of the questions. How much is trust about interpersonal relationships? How much is it being about being vulnerable to factors or people outside our control? And you can use your thinking about the questions to help you. So in your table groups, take one of those questions. Anything anyone wants to share from what they were talking about? I heard an interesting thing on this table, that, it, that trust is about the conventions of society. That, that's quite an interesting thing. So if, you're, if you've lived and worked in different cultures or different organisations, our levels of trust and what systems and processes you trust are very different. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, Just putting you on the spot for a second. The, and and the, that, that was a sort of interesting idea. Yeah, I was just um, thinking that, um, in essence, um, we expect a lot of things to work because we've grown up in a, in a culture of practice, if you will. So you phone a, a paramedic, for example, and someone turns up and they start treating your relative who's lying on the floor in a completely vulnerable position. You don't start saying, well, I don't particularly like you as a paramedic. I don't trust you as a person. Can I have another paramedic, please? You, you just assume that person knows their job and expect them to do the best they can for your relative. Right. I'm saying that might be completely different if you phone an ambulance in Kenya, for example, right. or if you're expecting, I don't know, if you, you get stopped by a police officer, you right. anticipate the reaction you're going to have from that police officer is not that they're going to step out of the car and shoot you, although it's quite possible they could do under certain circumstances. Precisely, yeah. They've got yeah. a gun, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. of course, well, that would be very different if you happen to be, I don't know, a black plumber in Brixton, for example. Precisely. Okay, good. So you're, now you're thinking about the, the frameworks around trust and, and what are the frameworks that are put in place to enable you to trust or not, which, which is something that we'll carry on investigating in a second. Anything else that people want to talk about? That, any ideas that came up on your table that you thought other people might be interested in? Yes. Builds on the last point a little bit about um, certainly about relationships and trust me I'm a doctor but the piece around actually we make judgments about who we can tr uh, trust instantly like does that person look a bit shifty do I need to right. keep hold of my briefcase and that's not based on any um, you know it could be based on all sorts of stuff precisely it? yes and that, those visual clues around who you're willing or not willing to trust are also incredibly interesting and there's been great psychological experiments i'm sure many of you know about them about putting the same person in different clothing and asking people to think what sort of profession they are or whether they would trust them or not very very interesting work okay now just think for a second i i've asked twice or three times would anyone like to say anything and now think about what your feeling was when I asked that question and why you would say yes or no. And is that to do with trust or feeling vulnerable? And it's an interesting question to start thinking about what is it in you? Do you would you trust your voice to the rest of the group, etc.? Or is it about the system in the room of having a microphone and someone asking you a question? You know, what is it that enables some people to trust that they're going to be, it's okay to speak and some people hold back? And that organisation is very interesting because often, and I mean in this room, every one of you has a viewpoint, but in organisations, it's very, very difficult to get people who don't trust that they will be listened to, to speak generally in the system, even though their views are equally valid quite often, or, you know, often more valid. There, there isn't a framework for them to speak into. 
that's a question, not a statement. So it, it, for you to think about. Um, OK, so moving on a bit. When I'm thinking about organisation design, I generally think in some sort of framework just to make it more straightforward for people to think about. And now if you think about how you could design in trust or blame, then you've got a small framework here. If you're thinking about strategy, how would you think about trust in a strategy? What makes people think that a strategy is trustworthy? And there was a great blog earlier this week on some audit um, organisation, a compliance organisation, who suggested that they put on the audit report, is your, is your business strategy sustainable over the next 10 years? And the CEO is supposed to answer yes or no or maybe or something. There isn't a sort of rumination around, well, we have no idea what the circumstances are, but the, the idea is if they put no, then the organisation's strategy is not trustworthy. So there's a framework being built in for people to try and sort of circumvent somehow or other because it's not, not a good question to ask. If you're thinking about the structures of an organisation and you're thinking about where would you design in trust or where could blame arise, one that I've been having some discussions with earlier this week is around the performance management system. And performance management systems generally are focused on an individual, not a team or an organisation, and they're generally focused on um, obje objectives, not out outcomes. And that makes it very difficult for people to trust the performance management system because it's completely object subjective and it's in the gift of the manager or the person doing the performance review. Now, another way of thinking about performance management systems is not to have them or do peer reviews. And then I get in this, um, um, this sort of questioning, but what about the pay and all that? Well, there are some organisations, um, cooperatives or collaborative organisations or some for-profit organisation who don't have performance reviews and they manage perfectly well and people trust the system. The, the question that came up in the organisation that I was talking with is, is about are the, is the performance management system eroding trust because people don't believe that the people who deserve the merit award are getting the merit award. Very, very interesting question. Then you think about process and capability. And you, I won't go around all of it, but you can see the sort of questions that I'm asking. And, and organisational processes or systems are generally, uh, uh, as a consequence of their design, either eroding trust or building trust. They're not negative, generally speaking. They're not a neutral system. And with the trust tends to go blame. You know, if, if someone gets a performance review that they don't like, then they might take the manager to an industrial tribunal. Now, what, what's the point of that? You know, they blame the manager for a, in, a performance review and then there's a penalty. So the, and that isn't solving the problem, which is probably more about performance reviews or the manager isn't adequately trained or the person doesn't know what to expect from a performance review or whatever. Blame, blaming something is not a problem-solving attribute. <coughs> However, here's a, I love this one, a checklist for checklists. <laughs> There's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto. I don't know how, who's read that? It's very interesting. It was, it's designed by a doctor, a surgeon, Atwal, uh, I've forgotten the second, Atwal Gawande, I think his name is. He's a surgeon. And he's, desi he's desi written a wonderful book, actually, called The Checklist Manifesto. And it's about making sure doctors don't leave, well, this is my interpretation of it, um, cotton wool swabs inside someone's body. You know, so that the, but he is actually arguing in favour of checklists being very, very good mechanisms for um, ultimately avoiding things blame. Because if people go down the checklist, then they've covered all the bases, in, in theory. And so this, this is a checklist for checklists, and I, I just put it up there for you to think, do checklists actually help avoid blame or build trust? Are, are they a useful mechanism? And clearly there isn't a right answer for that, because in some cases they're very, very useful. I used to work for British Airways, and the, in the, on the flight deck, the, the um, captain and the first officer are going down the checklist all the time. Have we got everything? And for the most part, the checklists work really, really well. Um, 
and they, but what I want, wants to um, had, had a piece of work there, which was a very interesting piece of work, because in spite of the checklist, so everything was going well, if something started to go wrong and the first officer told the captain, the captain had a tendency to overrule the first officer. There wasn't an equality in the relationship. It was a power relationship, and that, that still goes on. And that um, Egyptian plane crash quite recently, well, a couple of years ago, I think, that was one of the causal factors that the, the, fl the first officer told the captain things were going wrong, and the captain refused to listen. So that's a, a trust thing around the um, relationship there. But the system of checklists kept the thing flying. OK, so the next question to talk to in groups about is, do frameworks, and I, when I say frameworks, I mean all the stuff around these various things. You see them all over the place in organizations, compliance frameworks, checklists, systems, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. Do they mitigate, uh, manage risk at the expense of trust? That's a question. Or do they build trust? Do you see what I'm asking? Okay, see if you can talk about that for about five or so minutes. Okay, so um, I'm going to pick on a table this time and then see what that feels like. So table H, what, what were you talking about? H. Okay, do you want to talk about your views on, on what that, on the question? Okay, now everybody else in the room, see what it feels like in, in terms of trust and risk and blame not to be picked on like that. Well, my table have an opt-out because I'm the facilitator on the table. All right. And when H was called out, they all looked at me despite, <laughs> despite me offering the microphone around. Well, they, are. they trust you to answer. They trusted my answer. Okay, but that's very interesting about this, uh, the social dynamics there. You've got a role. See how it starts to play out. It's, it, it's, and that's it, it, fun to look at. Okay, sorry, go ahead. We, we really talked about what we meant by framework and the different types of frameworks. And some of the language that came out was, well, if the framework is overly prescriptive, then that will minimise trust. So we were then having discussions about the variations on frameworks. Right. And we were talking about whether some frameworks are useful because they help fill gaps that perhaps people can't hold all the information in their head. So it's useful as a checklist. Right. Um, but we were saying that in terms of the, the framework itself, then when is a framework not a framework? And, and when does it overstep the mark in terms of either it promoting trust or reducing trust. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, when does a framework overstep the mark? And I don't know, <coughs> uh, as I said earlier, I spent quite a lot of time in America, and the, one of the things I noticed was it's a very rules-based culture, and that doesn't allow for much innovation and creativity in some dimensions. Obviously, it does in others. I called it the stand behind the yellow line mentality. You know, and if you step over the yellow line, there were all sorts of words in American usage that you don't hear in England, like, what is the penalty? Who said you could do that? And then I did actually, I was in an organization and something went wrong and someone came to me and said, who should I blame? And I thought that was very interesting that I was being asked to tell that person who that person should blame for the incident. Um, and I said, well, you don't, there's no, no blame is attached. Something's gone wrong in the system. But what people do tend to think about frameworks as having an authority in their own right. And I'll t I had this very funny experience, which I still makes me laugh. I was looking, I was walking along a street in a city, and I'd just got off the bus. And a guy, young man came towards me with his um, smartphone in his hand with a map on it. And then he said to me, do you know where the bus stop is? And I said, yes, it's 100 yards up there. I just got off the bus. And he looked at it and he said, but this says it's here. <laughs> and that was just so sweet. He didn't know whether to trust the smartphone or trust the person. <laughs> and I thought that was a, a sort of delightful little example of how do you know where to put your trust? <laughs> 
And, you know, I've, I imagine some of you have been in the situation, and I have too, where I've mistakenly told people that it's... Because I get left and right confused, and they ask me for directions, and I say, turn right. And then they go off there, and I suddenly realize, no, I meant left, but they've already gone. You know, and, and then, then I haven't proved trustworthy, but they don't know it, and it was a mistake. Do you see what I mean? So how do you unravel those sorts of system things versus... The, the sort of unwitting things, which is a, b a bit to your point of when does a framework miss the point, essentially, which is really worth looking at in organisations because often systems do miss the point and they, as I said, they do erode trust or they um, do have unintended consequences. Another little story I'm rather fond of is a nursery school that, where the parents... Um, wouldn't collect their children on time. And the staff obviously trusted the parents to collect the children on time in order that the staff could close down the nursery and go home. So they hit on this cunning plan of charging the parents a dollar a moment, a minute, do a dollar a minute for every minute that they were late in collecting the child. And the unintended consequence of that, well, first of all, it was a framework for maintaining that trust that you would collect your child on time. But then it went disastrously wrong because a dollar a minute was rather cheap. So the parents ended up collecting their children even later. <laughs> so if you are going to put on a framework, make sure you're thinking through the unintended consequences because, you know, that, the unintended consequences could be a reduction in risk or an increase in blame. And that, that is another interesting thing to start thinking about of what are the consequences, thank you, of, of um, these frameworks that people have in organisations. And I'm sure that you're able to think of several that you have that have got unintended consequences of of trust or blame or risk attached to them. Often frameworks are designed to mitigate risk. And, and the level of risk that, and the quantity of frameworks depends on the risk appetite of the organisation. So if you look at an organisation like um, Zappos, which is a shoe retailer, I don't know if you know it, or Valve, a computer games company, they have um, very low levels of rules and regulations, although in fact Zappos has now introduced this system called holacracy, which is, is awash with rules and regulation. Um, but, or Gore is another one with a flat organisation. They have not many rules or regulations and a lot of empowerment. And that itself is, is a sort of risk mitigation. The, the question is, how do you give people enough trust to let them get on with the job and don't involve the organisation as a whole in a reputational damage? And you see things like that going on with, you know, the Twitter feeds and, that, and what have you, where the, that risk has been eroded and then they slap on a social media policy. And that means that no one can tweet about anything, you know, those sorts of things. So those, you know, sometimes the penalty is, is worse than the original breach, if you see what I mean. So, you know, the level that you're going to go to to mitigate risk is in relation to maintaining trust in, in the situation of a breach is another thing to think about. So when moving on to the third part of this about delivering trust, so we've, we've looked about defining trust, we've looked about designing it in through the systems and frameworks, and now we're moving on to what is about, it about delivering trust. It is dynamic. Trust is, is not a thing that is stable, and you can move it, and we've done that to some extent in the room. You know, you're, you're, going, you're sort of maybe, I'm going to put words in your mouth now, wondering who I'm going to pick on next to speak up. You know, there's a sort of level of something going on that is something to do with how much you trust me to not or not... To, to ask you or not ask you kind of thing. Um, so it's a dynamic, it's part of the vitality of relationships and it, you can trust people in some dimensions and not in others. You know, and I've, I've got two daughters and I, I trust both of them to, to um, <coughs> ring me up quite frequently and I would never ever trust one of them to arrive at the time she said she was going to arrive at. But I know she'll stay in contact with me. And the other one, I would trust to arrive at the time she said she was. You know, the, so even in relation to one person, you're having different levels of trust depending on what it is. Um, and it involves personal responsibility. And that personal responsibility starts to think about... In, if you feel yourself saying, 
who should I blame? Ask yourself, who is responsible? Should I be taking more responsibility or should I help somebody else rather than leap into a blame or risk thing? And it's characterised by these things, and I guess that you've talked about them quite a lot over the last few days. Um, and I like the link in this dis dis definition of matters of ethics, because most organisations, um, certainly government ones, I don't, I don't know if in your government organisation you have a code of ethics, do you? And doctors have codes of ethics, and professionals have codes of ethics. And sometimes the codes of ethics get lost. They're not, they're not lived. And that might be a framework that actually could help build trust if you were, if you were looking at a values-based or ethics-based organisation rather than a rules-based one or a policies-based one or a frameworks-based one. So when you're delivering it, you're trying to think, as we're thinking about trust in the organisation, mitigating risk and thinking about blame, what is it that we have to keep on looking at? You know, so do we need to keep on looking at, are we maintaining trust? And um, there's a certain level of linking trust to engagement, but that's a sort of rather tenuous link, because you can be engaged and do a good job, but not trust people. So that, you know, that there's a disconnect if you think that engagement is equal to trust all the time. I think there are... I'm going to go into the three points now. The, the, no, I've got two. Good. I must have avoided the three specifically. Um, <coughs> So there's evidence, you have to prove that you're trustworthy in an organisation. And I'm not talking just about individuals, I'm talking about the systems. Is the system trustworthy? So if you don't go back to a performance management system or a doctor's checklist, is it trustworthy most of the time? You know, does a checklist stop somebody leaving a swab in a patient? Well, if, if, if a um, nurse sees someone a doctor leaving a swab in a patient, does she think, oh, well, he's followed the checklist, it's okay, I needn't say anything, he must be right? Or does she say to the doctor, you've left the swab in, and then that she might feel very uncomfortable because the doctor is a professional and she believes he's right? So, you know, a checklist can act in, or any system can act in one or two ways. It can be for or against or with trustworthiness. And then to be... Um, deliver trust, you have to risk, I think, a certain amount of vulnerability, which we all do every day. And organisations, if, if you can talk about them sort of a, in an abstract sense, are not very keen on being vulnerable to another party. They try and avoid it, but it's unavoidable. And, and your organisations could probably be more vulnerable in, in some respects. They can be vulnerable but still risk averse. You know, you can, you can, it's, it's not a blanket thing um, when you can't control or monitor stuff. You know, you can't control or monitor and there was that, do you remember the um, nuclear melt, uh, the tsunami in Japan that pulled out that nuclear reactor and it actually broke the supply chain right across the world. Well, you, you're vulnerable to that supply chain breaking. There's nothing you can do about that. But to make yourself trustworthy to your customers, you could have a certain level of inventory, which would mitigate against the just-in-time sort of thing. Or you could have a level of trustworthiness by saying, this isn't the fault of anybody. We will try and get our stocks to you as quickly as possible. And you tell them the situation in a communication sort of way. So you're thinking about how you can maintain trustworthiness whatever the system ha whatever happens in the context what is it that will maintain trustworthiness that you're trying to build so your final discussion question is what are the organizational indicators of trustworthiness that you can design in or take out of that are not that are mitigating against trustworthiness in your organization and if you can come up with one or two things that you think are good indicators of trustworthiness that you'll be looking for, or, or things in your organisation which you think mitigate against trustworthiness, then let's have a look at those. And I promise I'll just ask for volunteers this time. So let's have a look. Any, in any organisational indicators of trustworthiness that people want to talk about or suggest to other people that they could learn from? Yes, good. We, we, I think we thought that um, 
when an organisation admits failure. Right. It trust, the trust in that organisation increases. Because That's of, right, yes. And when they apologise for doing something rather than spinning out... Do, doing a spin thing. Yeah. Yes, no, I can't remember which organisation. There was one quite recently which did a magnificent apology and everybody was delighted that they apologised. Yes, that's, that's a very good one. So that you apologise and you show that you, you're vulnerable and you're going to learn from it. Excellent. Other or indicators of organisational trustworthiness? We, talk, we talked about um, autonomy and levels of autonomy. Oh, OK. And perhaps an indicator is around trusting um, people or systems at some level of the organisation to get on with the job. Right. And so that the decision making is as close to service de delivery as possible rather than being dictated through, you know, from on high. Right. So that's what we talked about autonomy. Yes, very good. You, the, 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 you put decision, you give people autonomy to make decisions and there are some organisations, and I guess you know of them, that, will, that do do that very well. So, for example, one of the hotel chains gives their uh, chambermaids £200 a month, I think, or, or a quarter, and they can use it what, as in whatever they, what they want to thank a customer. And, and those sorts of things are very, very interesting about how you help people feel that they've got some um, voice in the organisation and a power to be trustworthy on things. Good. So that's another one. Any others? We talked about open communication. And uh, an example on the table was that um, you can freely contact or, or respond to um, press inquiries. It didn't have to go through any... Um, press office oh, right. any, anybody yes. that took a call could speak freely to to the press yes so I that think that's very interesting that you, that you don't have a policy around f a social media or press the um, an IBM um, I'm not sure if it still has but a couple of years ago when they were thinking about a social a social media policy IBM decided not to have a social media policy. They decided exactly that. We've got a code of ethics, we've got our values, we think all our staff will just adhere to that. And I think that's still the case. And they've, they haven't, as far as I'm aware, had any breach of that trust in them. Um, and there was that, I just heard this lovely phrase, you can mandate adequacy, but it doesn't lead to excellence. I don't know if you want to say something in your closing bit, but that... that that's a very interesting statement, that, you could, that frameworks could mandate adequacy but not excellence, and maybe the excellence is about the trust building and empowerment and autonomy and, this, and so forth that we've talked about. So just to summarise, because I think I'm at time here, there isn't, and you can't trust without taking a certain level of risk, in, in my view. Trust involves risk and vulnerability. S frameworks can mitigate some risks and they don't always build trust. They build some levels of trust, but they don't necessarily build trust. And then the third thing is that trust is built on trustworthy relationships. And that isn't just personal relationships, it's system relationships and process relationships and structure relationships, which are trustworthy. So, you know, if you go back to the very first picture of the trapeze artist, they have a they are, have a sort of relationship with the bar and the rope that it's going to work. And it's a trustworthy thing, and it goes through endless fail safe things, and they trust the um, staff to have tested that. So that's a testing system. So I think when you start to think about trust and designing it into or out of organisations, and hopefully you're designing it out unconsciously and you'll quickly go back and rectify it, um, that the, you start to think about what is it around the frameworks, the processes, the systems, the structures that will help or hinder trust building and trustworthiness and will limit blame and manage the risks adequately but not overly. So that's as much as I wanted to say and the, um, I think it's open to questions or moving on. <laughs>